Welcome back to the Division of Mental Health and Addictions Cultural Competency Webinar Series. Today, we are joined by the executive leadership of the National Wellness Institute with CEO Chuck Gillespie and VP of Growth and Innovation, Kelly Straub. We've had conversations over this past year regarding really the growth of our cultures and our overall capacity, competencies, and support of the mental health and addictions field with our continuing efforts in looking at growth of our organizations. We've looked at Transformation Change Agency as a key leadership uh, series in focusing on more and further professional development for our staff and also looking at new ways of building innovative and uh, implementing programs within our organizations. As we continue Transformation Change Agency and look at the um, upcoming changes in policy and practice, we're joined with our National Wellness Institute leadership to really take a look at high levels of industry improvements and innovation across the board through the social activation of wellness model, and also looking at specifically what our individual, our team, and our overall organization's responsibilities are in being able to implement a culture where social activation wellness model can exist and continue to amplify the work and direct services that we do for our patients. So without further ado, let me, uh, let me welcome Chuck Gillespie and Kelly Schraub and hand over to Kelly for the initial presentation as then Chuck and I join her back after the presentation to discuss some key takeaways and insights uh, around the social activation model. Kelly? Well, thank Thank you so much, Sunny. It's such a delight to be here with everybody. I'm going to just kind of hide the camera here and get us kicked off. So today's presentation is on the social activation of wellness model. So the first question we have today is what is the social activation of wellness model? Well, NWI's social activation of wellness brings three critical components of well-being into one simple and highly actionable model that's purposefully designed to shift mindsets, behaviors, and practices, and also promote positive change from a multicultural, multidimensional perspective. The first component establishes a comprehensive definition of high-level wellness. As the worldwide voice of the wellness community, the National Wellness Institute is uniquely positioned to elevate what it means to be, go beyond wellness to help all individuals, including employees, employers, wellness leaders, and all individuals everywhere, activate and achieve what we refer to as high-level wellness. So what is high-level wellness? Well, at NWI, stemming from the timeless work of Dr. Halbert Dunn, who's also known as the father of the wellness movement, we define high-level wellness as functioning optimally within your current environment. That's the second component. It requires us to identify the different aspects of our ever-changing environments through a multicultural lens. Where does one live? Where does one work? Where do they play? Where do they learn? And where do they reflect? And then the third component of the social activation of wellness model takes into consideration NWI's six dimensions of wellness. What actions are actively being taken to help one make forward movement, shifting mindsets, behaviors, and practices, and achieving greater fulfillment in each dimension over the course of time. And we'll take a closer look at each one of these individual dimensions in just a bit. So question two, what is the relevance of the social activation of wellness model to cultural competency in the workplace? Well, the SOW model or social activation of wellness is how we can do it, right? It involves each of these six dimensions of wellness in addition to that environmental aspect of where one lives, works, plays, learns, or reflects. Cultural competency in the workplace is what we are doing. So we know that the DMHA vision is an unyielding focus on promoting and supporting the mental health of, and wellness of people in Indiana, and that this is inclusive of mental health organizations as employers and of mental health staff as employees. 
The third question is, how can we work together to successfully shift mindsets, behaviors, and practices? Well, we believe that the first of our team's responsibilities, including both employers and employees, is to first demonstrate how much you care. Creating and influencing positive change, including the elevation of cultural competency in the workplace, first calls on each of us as teams of employees and employers working together toward common goals and objectives to demonstrate how much we truly care for ourselves and for others. Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, probably said it best and it can't be stated enough. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But it's one thing to say that and another thing entirely to put it into active practice. So before we begin, I just as we're all listening, let's put this in action together with a brief reflection. So call to mind those individuals who consistently show genuine interest in you, your life, your work. Just hold that in your thought for a moment. And now call to mind an individual, either past or present, who has made an indelible impact on your life. What about these people still resonates with you? Did they stand out for their keen intellectual skills or something that came from their heart? At the core of who we are as human beings, each of us wants to know that above everything else, we are cared for and appreciated. It's part of what fulfills our emotional and spiritual dimensions of wellness to the brim. So our intention is to be and become more mindful, effective, and culturally competent leaders in our workplaces, demonstrating that we genuinely and authentically care for ourselves, our fellow team members, our individual clients and patients, our organizations, even the billions of people around the world who are living their lives right alongside us. Second, we want to build a culture of safety and trust, and we have to work both consciously and strategically to do this. We can take direction from John Bertrand Artestride, Haiti's first democratically elected president. He said, learning is strengthened and solidified when it occurs in a safe, secure, and normal environment. All of life is learning. And the social activation of wellness model exemplifies this toward the goal of developing multicultural, multidimensional, high level wellness policies and outcomes. Employees, as well as their employed team members, are equally responsible for building safe, supportive, and multiculturally sensitive working environments, and also modeling behaviors that promote care, kindness, and calm to others. So why is it so important for us to build these cultures of safety and trust? Well, there's many reasons. Confidentiality. Without a commitment to confidentiality, individuals may be hesitant to share openly and honestly. Gossip can never be allowed by anyone at any time. Authenticity allows individuals to lean into their inalienable right to feel what they feel ask for help when it's needed, and speak authentically, including being direct, honest, and respectful towards the ideas and opinions of others. Non-judgment. So environments steeped in non-judgment build cohesion and give individuals permission to be their full selves. We know that human beings naturally tend to judge their own experiences. For example, liking, disliking, or having a sense of neutrality about something but we also judge the experience of others. We're gonna talk more about it, but self-awareness and self-regulation are key skills that we use to help individuals recognize and acknowledge these judgments, let go of them in the moment and remain neutral. Also, well-being and self-care. Cultures of safety and trust that put an emphasis on the prioritization of one's own personal well-being and self-care not only positively impact how individuals show up and perform, but encourage the modeling of these behaviors for others to improve all areas of life, both personal and professional. Mutual respect or the 
reciprocity, excuse me, of respect between two or more people. This is critical to building and maintaining healthy relationships. Um, it recognizes one's contributions, promotes positivity, improves communications, and enhances teamwork. And compassion. This is the caring element of building safety and trust. So an emotional response to the feeling of empathy or the awareness and recognition of another's emotions Compassion calls on us to deepen our understanding of others and alleviate any potential suffering. It helps people feel understood and validated. It builds connection and allows us to evolve as human beings. And when it comes to well being, researchers have discovered that the act of actually just practicing compassion slows heart rate and increases one's feeling of pleasure. And finally, the power of presence. The gift of presence is one of the greatest gifts we can give to ourselves and those we're with. The epitome of safety and trust, our ability to be and stay right here, right now, in the present moment, tells those we're with whether we care or not. And presence also ensures that those we're with feel seen, heard, valued, and respected. It's a critical skill, especially in our ever moving fast paced remote working worlds. And it's really critical to our success in all relationships and in our workplace outcomes and in the development of policies that are both successful and sustainable. So I wanna talk about presence a little bit more in depth. So how many of us can relate to this image? Finding ourselves juggling multiple tasks at one time. And how many of us can relate to the feeling of overwhelm on the face of this woman? Here's what we know. Multitasking and stress are at an all time high. While they may be commonplace in today's world, both are extremely taxing on the human brain and negatively affect human behavior, relationships, and policy outcomes. So let's start with multitasking. It is actually the number one culprit against workplace presence. So context switching, if you haven't heard of the term, refers to the loss of time one experiences when switching their focus and attention from one activity to another before completion. The term was first introduced by Gerald Weinberg. He's a psychologist and computer scientist at the University of California, San Diego. So his research with software development teams led to the discovery that programmers attempting to complete multiple tasks at one time decrease their productivity rate at the rate of 20% per task. So this is what that looks like. And why is this relevant to our workplace? Well, it's pretty simple because the effects of context switching are cumulative. Engaging in just one task at a time, not only is how the brain is hardwired to work, but it allows us to give 100% of our focus and attention to that one task. But when we attempt to start managing two tasks at one time, our focus capacity actually drops to 80%. We only have 40% of our focus and, and time and attention available for each project. Add in one more task, that drops down to 60%, only 20% per project, and the pattern continues. So here's what happens. When we attempt to multitask or we choose to actively participate in more than one activity at one time, we lose 20% of our valuable time and productivity to each task or person. So this comes down to basic neuroscience. The human brain is actually hardwired for speed, achievement, and focusing on one project, task, or person at a time. To make all of this worse, or kind of to drive it home a little bit more, scientists at Stanford suggest that multitasking actually lowers IQ by roughly 10 points per project. So if we think about that for a moment, when we combine the loss of time and productivity from multitasking, it not only do we lose that, but we simultaneously decrease our IQ, so the odds are kind of stacked against us. 
And we can see um, with this infographic from Velocity that that's not all. It takes us four times longer to recognize new things when we're multitasking. It takes more time to switch tasks, causing mental blocks, leading to mistakes, and it's costly. Multitasking and interruption equate to more than 31 lost work weeks and over 650 billion in lost revenue in the US alone each year. So multitasking and context switching are negative behavior habits. So beyond these losses directly associated with time, productivity, and dollars, they really disrupt our relationships. And as employees and employers, as we work to build that culture of safety and trust, we must hold on to that truth that people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. So if we intend to implement successful workplace policies that are culturally competent and promote well-being, staying actively engaged and giving our full attention to those we're with is essential. Without it, we make things, not people, our top priority and are actively working against the very outcomes we've set out to achieve. So stress, let's move from multitasking to stress because the two really do go hand in hand. So Hans Selye, a Slovakian born physician and researcher has become known as the father of stress research and first coined the term more than 50 years ago. He describes stress as the body's nonspecific response to any demand, whether it's caused by or results in pleasant or unpleasant stimuli. Self-reported stress, especially on the heels of a worldwide pandemic that has rapidly become our new norm, is at an all-time high. And it's affecting mental health, the mental health of nearly every person, community, and company around the globe, without exception. And our youngest population, tomorrow's leaders, are at greatest risk. So at NWI, we believe and recognize that stress is a normal and natural part of life. It happens to everyone to varying degrees and at different times. And our human body is brilliantly designed to both experience and respond to it. When we experience a stressor or any perceived change or challenge, whether positive, no, neutral, or negative, our body produces chains of physical and mental responses that help us adjust to the new situation or circumstance. These biological responses are what we commonly refer to as stress. So we use a stress continuum model to help people understand the spectrum of possible individual experiences associated with stress and promote specific techniques like self-awareness, self-regulation, mindful listening and questioning, mindful communication and more to help individuals develop strategies for both recognizing and appropriately responding versus reacting to stress in a positive and productive manner. In addition to creating proactive plans to manage stress as it begins to arrive. We also recognize the importance of understanding that not all stress is bad. For example, when we're energized and excited, we can feel positive stress, something that is beneficial and important to our productivity and achieving optimal well-being. This could be riding a roller coaster, going out on a date, winning a race, or starting a new job. Positive stress can also keep us alert, help us study for an exam, meet a project deadline, and even avoid danger. When we're experiencing little to no pressure, we are in a state of neutral stress. Here, we're typically happy, hopeful, peaceful, and seeing general improvements in most, if not all, areas of our personal and professional lives. What we need to be careful of, and what we're really referring to here, is the accumulation of that negative stress. When left unaddressed over time, it can leave us feeling fatigued, burnt out, concerned, worried, scared, anxious, even fearful. And this type of stress can come from a variety of sources, relationship changes, loss of a job or a loved one, receiving a medical diagnosis, um, changing or unenforced work policies, or other challenges. So toward the goals of building resilience, advancing personal well-being, and maximizing productivity outcomes in the workplace, we want both employers and employees 
to be mindful of the stress they may be experiencing and develop techniques to avoid potential outcomes associated with the development of chronic stress. So if we look at stress by the numbers, according to WebMD, more than half of Americans say they fight with friends and or loved ones because of stress. And 70% indicate that they experience physical and emotional symptoms of stress. A recent 2020 Gallup poll found that worldwide, 40% of adults reported feeling worry or stress, quote, a lot of the previous day. That's a 5% increase over the previous year and the highest level measured since 2006. In real numbers in 2020, that equated to more than 190 million additional people around the world feeling more stressed than ever. And clearly those numbers are still actively on the rise. So whether we recognize it in our own lives and work or not, stress is a serious factor across all populations around the globe. So what happens if we don't develop strategies to effectively manage our stress? Well, there are multiple answers, but one of the most relevant is how this accumulation of stress affects our physical health and our longevity. Health span refers to the period of one's life that is spent healthy or how many years one remains free from disease. Lifespan refers to the length of time a person lives or the total number of years they're alive. And there's a significant difference between the two. In the United States, the average health span is 63 years, while the average lifespan is 79. If you think about that for a moment, that's a pretty astounding 16 years of existing without health while we're still living. And as we age, health typically begins to decline slowly over a period of about 10 or more years, and then rapidly toward the final years of life. So what impacts on health span, our health span so we can assure it's extended for a longer, healthier life? So Dr. Peter, Peter Atia noted longevity research describes four components that directly impact our health span. Our mental cognition and function, our ability to tolerate stress, our physical capacity and overall health, and our internal purpose and external support. So knowing all of this, what success skills do we want teams of employers and employees to develop and implement not only to take better care of themselves, but be the best they can be and lead by example to ensure greater levels of well being and resilience among their valued and employed team members and greater uptake of implemented policies and procedures. Well, the first is self awareness. So Lao Tzu made a timeless statement. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. It's really difficult for us to take others where we haven't been or instruct others to go where we aren't willing to go ourselves. And this doesn't mean that every program or policy we implement will be the best for each individual person. In fact, it means the exact opposite. To ensure success, we must take a high-level, multidimensional, multicultural approach to the development of our wellness policies, a strategy that allows for and honors individual difference while acknowledging the importance of each person's unique personal or professional environments where they live, work, play, learn, and reflect. Hence, the application of the social activation of wellness model to achieve cultural competency in our workplaces. So since 1977, um, the foundation of NWI's learning has been our six dimensions of wellness. And we have an associated six dimensions of wellness self-assessment tool. Professional leaders from around the world continue to utilize these unique trainings and resources to advance greater awareness um, or greater levels of self-awareness when it comes to wellness and well-being focused policies that actually shift mindsets, behaviors, and practices both short and long term. So we're going to take a very high level look at each dimension 
um, in the order that they support the social activation of wellness. So the first is emotional wellness. This includes the degree to which one feels positive and enthusiastic about oneself and life. In this dimension, it's important to be aware of and accept one's own feelings and take that optimistic approach to life. Physical wellness puts focus and emphasis on movement, fitness, sleep, relaxation, and maintaining a healthy lifestyle, including the consumption of foods and beverages that enhance rather than impair good health. Intellectual wellness is defined as lifelong learning. In this dimension, it's important to stretch one's thinking and challenge one's mind in both intellectual and creative pursuits in addition to identifying potential problems and choosing appropriate courses of action based on available information. Occupational wellness refers to satisfaction in one's work. In this dimension, it's important to seek out a career which is consistent with one's personal values, interests, and beliefs. Individuals are encouraged to develop functional, transferable skills through structured involvement opportunities and to remain active and involved. Spiritual wellness recognizes one's search for meaning and purpose in human existence. In this dimension, it's important to be true to oneself, live each day in a way that is consistent with one's values and beliefs, go beyond faith and religion to ponder the meaning of life, and be tolerant of the beliefs of others. And finally, social wellness includes making contributions to the common welfare of one's community and thinking of others. In this dimension, it's important to live in harmony with others and with the environment. So the end result, when we put this all together, is the social activation of wellness or functioning optimally within your current environment functioning optimally where you live, work, play, learn, and reflect. But how do we do that personally? And perhaps even more importantly, how do we sustain it and demonstrate it to others? Well, that requires the development and implementation of self-regulation. Psychotherapist and founder of SomaticWise, Andrea Bell, provides a simple and clear definition. Self-regulation means control of oneself by oneself. And that's important, control of oneself by oneself. Self-regulation is a learned process. It's a teachable skill. The ability to begin self-regulating begins in childhood and continues to develop throughout our lifetime. We're never too old to learn the power of self-awareness and self-regulation. And expanding this as an adult actually requires self-awareness, along with a commitment to consciously manage our emotions and handle stress appropriately. It's very closely tied to and contributes to the development of emotional intelligence or the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions. So to effectively self-regulate, one must increase their ability to manage their energy states, resist impulsive behaviors that might worsen their situation, and calm themselves during heightened stress. So if we go back to stress, we focus on a couple of models and training systems to help individuals better manage through self-awareness and self-regulation. One is what we call the stress cycle model. And this really brings the importance of self-awareness to the forefront and demonstrates how our bodies generally respond to both internal stressors, and that might be our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and external stressors, which could be things like work, family, money, time, and health. So just very briefly and high level, there's a conscious and unaware stress cycle that you can see on the left in red and a conscious and aware stress cycle that you can see on the right in green. So generally speaking, without awareness and regulation, the unconscious or unaware cycle goes something like this. We experience a stress reaction that sends the body's biological warning system into overdrive. 
our sympathetic nervous system turns on and our bodies are flooded with hormones that initiate this physical response. And it might be an increase in blood pressure or heart rate. What happens is if that is left unchecked, we begin to operate on autopilot. And maybe we would turn to unhealthy coping strategies. This might be denial, overeating, overworking, isolation, substance misuse or abuse, many, many more. We may also experience physical or psychological breakdowns, maybe exhaustion or being diagnosed with a clinical disorder, including chronic pain, illness, insomnia, anxiety, depression. And here we're taking away from our health span and our lifespan instead of contributing to them. On the contrary, with self-awareness, self-regulation, and a robust collection of wellness and well-being practices and skills to pull from, we can recognize our body's biological response to a stressor in the moment it happens and stop the cycle in its tracks. With that, we turn to this conscious or aware stress cycle, which engages the body's parasympathetic nervous system. We begin to relax in response to the stressor, return to homeostasis, we integrate and can continue developing healthy coping strategies, and we can use conscious choice and our emotional intelligence to manage the stressful situation appropriately. So these processes are obviously critical to both personal and professional outcomes for both employees and employers alike. Another model that we work with is called the window of tolerance. So this stems from the work that is um, steeped in neuroscience by Dr. Dan Siegel. He's a clinical professor of psychiatry and co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Institute. So this window visually represents a person's optimal state of arousal so they can function optimally, achieve well-being, build resilience, and thrive in everyday life. Simply put, each person has an ideal window that represents their calm, cool, and collected comfort zone. When we're inside this optimal space, we can adjust and manage to what life is bringing us. We can self-soothe and quickly regulate our emotions, stay mentally engaged and emotionally balanced, and receive, process, and integrate new information with ease. Everybody's size and shape of their window is different. So some may have a very narrow window. Uh, they may feel their emotions very intensely. They might find that those emotions are difficult to manage. While those with a wider window may be able to handle these emotions and situations without feeling like their ability to function has been significantly impacted. What happens when we are outside of our window is that we enter what we call hyper or hypo arousal. So hyper arousal is our body's fight or flight response. This includes maybe anxiousness, impulsivity, being or becoming overwhelmed, exhausted, or emotionally distressed. And hypo arousal is our body's freeze response. We might become disconnected, separated from our feelings and emotions, feeling numb, empty, or paralyzed. But using these models, we can see how self-awareness and self-regulation actually allow us to recognize our experience and manage our responses with those healthy coping strategies to get back into our window of tolerance. So another critical skill we want employers and employees to develop simultaneously for lasting outcomes is mindful listening. And our unique approach to helping wellness leaders and professionals enhance their listening skills is far too in-depth to cover here, but I do want to touch on a few highlights. So first, we know it's important to recognize that most people give the impression of listening when they're only hearing sounds without meaning. Um, as Stephen Covey states so eloquently, and we've all heard this, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. And how many of us have found ourselves in that situation? Hopefully nobody that's listening to this presentation today. <laughs> I love this classic Charles Schultz um, Peanuts cartoon. Lucy says, so what do you think? 
Charlie Brown says, what difference does it make? You don't, you never listen anyway. Lucy says, I was just making conversation. And Charlie Brown, in all of his eloquence and brilliance, says, when you make conversation, you have to listen to. You do? So let's take a moment real quick. Together, let's each think back to a time when we were talking to someone and knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were actually listening to what we were saying. So they were listening. How did that experience make you feel? Did you like it? Now let's think back to a time when we were talking to somebody and we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were not listening, that we were not being heard or listened to. How did that experience make you feel? Did you like it? So it's safe to say that everyone has had a time where they felt truly heard by another and liked it. And that at some point in our lives, we have all felt like we were not heard and we didn't like it. When we commit as employers and leaders to using these critical skills of self-awareness and regulation to be and stay actively present and engaged in the communication process, we actually listen to what we hear. We receive the information we need to respond effectively and intelligently, and we demonstrate how much we care. And at a core level, again, that's what we want to know above everything. So hearing is not the same thing as listening. Not listening is actually cited as a core issue in broken relationships, whether that's with coworkers, team members, family, friends, or more. We know that active listening requires involvement by both individuals, and that most people give the impression of listening when they're actually not, and listening is a habit we develop consciously over time. It involves paying attention to and receiving and contriving meaning from what is heard. At NWI, that's what we wanna teach people to do. If we lose focus and attention and are only hearing words without engaging in mindful listening with the objective of seeking meaning from what we hear, context is lost and our ability to respond and guide appropriately is severely diminished. Mindful listening is just one part of what we cover when it comes to developing an entire collection of mindful communication skills. So we know that clarity about who we are at a core fundamental level leads to authentic or genuine communication with others. But what does that really mean? So gaining clarity about who we are includes our beliefs, our values, our purpose, mission, motivations, behaviors, our competencies and skills. All of these things build confidence and allow us to be seen, heard, understood, and appreciated for exactly who we are. In return, clarity puts us in a position to give the same gift to others, to communicate with them in ways that allow them to be seen, heard, and understood for exactly who they are. So we, want, we begin by examining the important role of body language and tone when it comes to mindfully connecting with ourselves and others. So the Moravian formula um, helps individuals understand the importance of body language and tone and why it's important. This theory supports um, through numerous research studies that only about 7% of what we perceive during the communication process comes from spoken words well, the other 93% comes from body language and tone. So this means that in order to be effective employers and employees that affect positive change, we must commit to being and staying actively present, involved and engaged with others at all times. It's also important to our earlier discussions about avoiding context switching and multitasking. So when it comes to mindful communication, Beyond those losses of time, productivity, and intellect, our body language and tone is telling others whether we are attentive and present or absent and preoccupied. 
we may believe, especially in today's world of working via virtual formats, that we can cover up or mask our distractions, stress, anxiety, but it's simply not possible. That's because we have been mastering body language and tone since the day we were born. From the moment we came into the world, we had to determine in any given moment if we were safe or not. We couldn't speak, we didn't have a solid grasp on human language, and we took our cues from the behaviors of others. And we've continued to practice that art of reading body language and tone throughout our lives and carry this well-developed skill into our interactions with others. At the bank, at the grocery store, at the gym, when we're out for a walk, and even and especially in our workplaces. We also want to understand the power of mirror neurons. So these are specialized types of brain cells that allow us to learn through imitation as we reflect the body language, facial expressions, emotions, even the actions of others. So according to the American Psychological Association, our brains mirror neurons activate equally when we perform an action and when we observe someone else perform the same action. It can make sense of why, when, and how sometimes we have an immediate or instinctive gut reaction to the thoughts, feelings, and intentions of others, or even why we yawn when others yawn. So how aware and self-regulated we are or aren't has a direct impact on our team, our clients, the overall feel and of the workplace. And to create the most positive um, and effective policies and to create rewarding spaces, we want to honor our commitment to building that culture of safety and trust, which is why it's important for us to pay attention to both body language, tone, and these and understand these mirror neurons. One more note, many facial expressions are universally recognized, but we'd be remiss not to recognize that body language can be perceived differently across various cultures. So this is especially important for global organizations or organizations with a high multicultural focus and lens of perception. So for example, eye contact, hand gestures, greeting another with a handshake, physical touch, posture, even silence may be interpreted differently depending on where a person is from. So as we begin to take a mindful approach to our relationships both in and out of the workplace, this means widening our lens of what it means to be a multicultural being. With this perspective, we can recognize that our identities include not only our race and ethnicity, our age, spiritual beliefs and practices, maybe gender identification, but also our relationship status, our geographic location, professional role, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, disabilities, body size, political affi affiliations, and more. In relation to the social activation of wellness and the six dimensions of wellness, an individual's environment also has a direct impact on overall wellness and well being. It's important to understand how both culture and environment may impact a person's behaviors. Things such as temperature, the number of people in a room, or being of different cultures can cause a person to give off nonverbal cues that may be misinterpreted. For example, a person may have their arms folded simply because it's cold, not because they're antisocial, and they may choose to shake hands, because not shake hands because they have a cold and don't wanna pass that on to others. Beyond that, we have already talked about mindful listening, but we'd be remiss not to talk about the importance of questioning as a component of mindful communication. Albert Einstein, one of the great genius minds of our century, said it best. If I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would use the first 55 minutes determining the proper questions to ask. So why is this important? Well, building strong relationships and developing um, mindful communication skills positions us to seek clarity and understanding through the use of meaningful, purposeful and proper questions, questions that lead us and others toward the solutions we seek 
individually or collectively. It taps into the innate human trait of curiosity. And combined with the intentional use of the skills we've developed, we're developing, curiosity opens the door to learning, discovery, and growth, and dramatically decrease, and can even eliminate the tendency to make assumptions, something that works in total opposition to mindful communication. It also creates forward movement, provokes new thoughts and feelings, develops trust and confidence, and demonstrates that you care, just to name a few. Finally, we can use all of this knowledge to shift our attention to what it means and why it's important to develop the ability to speak the language of behavior. Doing so actually helps us cultivate greater levels of awareness when it comes to ourselves and to those around us, since a key goal of mindful communication is knowing who we're talking to and who we're working with. So human behavior is what we do and how we do it. It's not who we are, that's our personality. And throughout our lives, it's what we do, whether engaging with family, socializing with friends, communicating with colleagues, or just going about our daily living, that shapes our behavioral language. And we can't escape the fact that we're all behaving in some way, shape, or form, always, and that that behavior is coming across to others through our body language and tone. So why is learning the language of behavior important? Well, this improves communication with others, creates commonality and understanding, builds greater connections, fosters safe learning environments, and decreases stress and anxiety. In relation specifically to stress, and as we quickly revisit our stress continuum model, here's an example of what might happen if we don't develop crucial behavioral language skills. And I'm gonna use myself as an example. So I'm what some would refer to as an influencer, or I'm outgoing, enthusiastic, optimistic, um, social and relationship oriented. This is how I see myself behaving all the time whether I'm experiencing stress or not. And it's what I believe others see me as too. So under no stress situations, how others perceive me and how I perceive myself match, and that's in alignment. However, under moderate or extreme stress, I actually begin adapting my own behaviors, even unconsciously, right, and having heightened and expressing these heightened emotions that I'm feeling. So how others perceive me and how I perceive myself can be dramatically different. So I might come across, instead of enthusiastic, outgoing, and charming, under moderate stress as self-promoting, insincere, superficial, overly optimistic, unrealistic, or nonsensical. And under extreme stress, I might come across as overly confident, talkative, a poor listener, a self-promoter, thoughtless, and even antisocial. If I don't have the ability to be self-aware, and if I do not have the ability to self-regulate or to safely communicate about the stress I'm experiencing because I'm not operating in a culture of safety and trust, it could result in a wide array of harmful or negative outcomes. My personal and professional relationships would likely suffer, my job might be in jeopardy, uh, my clients or patients may not connect to me or take in and activate the information that I'm sharing, and on a personal level, all dimensions of my health and well being could be negatively affected. So, as we look all at all of this and take it all into consideration, and we revisit our initial questions what is the re relevance of the social activation of wellness to cultural competency in the workplace? And how can we work together to successfully shift mindsets, behaviors, and practices? We suggest that employers and employees work independently and collectively to develop multidimensional, multicultural, high-level wellness competencies that are actionable, achievable, and sustainable. 
And that's what we do at the National Wellness Institute. So our foundation rests on what we've already shared, covering the six dimensions of wellness and our multicultural wellness wheel. In addition to that, we have a robust wellness promotion competency model, nine competency courses, and the gold standard certified wellness practitioner um, credential. We also offer endless opportunities to learn well. Um, and I included some of our courses and trainings here that might be especially, especially impactful for those in the workplace and especially in this area of um, mental health focus. Specifically, our worksite wellness specialist, um, our wellness that works going beyond DEI, mastering workplace wellness laws and wellness and clinical practice, we also have an exciting new 21 day well challenge workplace toolkit. So all of these resources, courses, trainings and programs are available through the National Wellness Institute. We offer credentials, courses and CECs, oh my. So those who um, are connected with us get to learn from the worldwide voice of the wellness community. Again, we provide those gold standard training and professional certificates. We have self paced or facilitator led courses. Um, incredible membership benefits, continuing education credits, live monthly webinar, webinars, resources, and tools.